think. Let's start right here. Hopefully this behaves itself. Um, should now see my screen. Good. <clears throat> All right, let's see. So this is an interesting case. Um, this is a young woman who um, was referred to our thoracic surgeons for a diaphragmatic hernia. You can see, you can see my radiographs, right? Yes. Good. So you see on the PA radiograph, we have um, a defect in the diaphragm. Here's the lateral. There's a little bump here. And um, this is the CT from just the other day. We already knew about it this time, so we just did this as a non-contrast. And you'll see there's the defect in the right lower chest. <clears throat> we have a previous study at MR that I'll bring up that shows that this is just liver. So this is a defect in the diaphragm associated with liver. But what made this interesting, when I was looking at this scan, what caught my attention was this funny looking vein, dilated and sort of tortuous in the right lower lobe. And you can see it comes off the left atrium immediately. And then at the very bottom, I saw these very odd looking pulmonary vessels, almost looks like dilated vessels. And and then this airway also caught my attention. It looks normal in the absence of other airways. You'll also notice the right lung is hypoplastic. And when I was looking at it, I realized there's a right upper lobe. And then you've got a bronchus intermedius. And then what looks like a middle and lower lobe, but we don't have a separate fissure. And don't have a typical appearance of a lower lobe. Maybe this is a superior segment. And this, these are the basal segments, but a very odd looking one. So it looks like a bilobed right lung with an anomalous vein, but it does drain to the atrium. And with a diaphragmatic hernia and these vessels it makes you think sort of like a scimitar spectrum without the scimitar vein. And then I'll bring up the MRA. This was done about a year ago because it really shows what this, these vessels are. And I'll make an axial in a minute. But if we go anteriorly, we can follow this vessel coming off the abdominal aorta. If we follow it up, let me actually get back here. Let's, um, here, let's go here. So here's the lung, and we have this vessel coming in medially. If we follow it back, you can follow it into the abdomen, and it communicates pretty low right here, hooks back up, and comes into the abdominal aorta. So I'll put it on an axial just so you can see this vessel. So here it is, here's celiac, and it's a little branch coming right off the aorta, and it courses right along the diaphragm and goes into the right lower lobe. And then we can see the funny draining vein plug right into the left atrium. So this is a systemic arterial supply with a hypoplastic right lung and a diaphragmatic hernia. We've seen all of these features with scimitar, but this is not a scimitar in that she doesn't have the anomalous drainage to the right atrium. But that was kind of fun, fun case, and it follows my rule of if there's one congenital anomaly, there's often another one, and the vascular ones seem to go with the airway. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I know we've talked, Howard, you've talked about diaphragmatic defects associated with scimitar as well. And then this case is an interesting case. This is a guy, he's 40, I think he's about 40, mid-40s, and uh, he works along the Mississippi River as a welder on one of the boats, or some of the barges and stuff that go along the Mississippi. And he presented with this cough, and it was unclear if he had a fever, or if he, but he was producing some sputum. And this was his radiograph from an outside hospital. And you can see what looks like a mass around the hilum. Here's the lateral, and we see this area of mass or consolidation. He had a CT scan at an outside institution, and we see this soft tissue encasing the upper lobe bronchus. There's consolidation. There's what looks like some low attenuation fluid there. The right upper lobe bronchus is attenuated, and you'll see that and the bronchus is narrowed. And then there's just very minimal lymph node enlargement, a little bit of subcrinal, maybe a hilar node, no pleural effusion. And um, he, at the time, uh, we were told he had uh, an MR, which we didn't see at the time, that showed what looked like leptomeningeal enhancement. So we were thinking, well, could this be an infection? And this part of the country, we would think about 
especially when you have a big mass like thing like this would be um, blastomycosis, which can affect the brain, both the brain itself can also cause um, leptom uh, can also cause a um, leptomeningitis. Uh, so he had a bronchoscopy, and these are the bronch images. So his trachea was a little bit red, but they saw this very, this white exudate in the upper lobe. And let me see if I need to go to the next image. And then here are further images. Here there's a lot of this sort of necrotic appearing tissue. You really look in here, this is very unhappy looking um, lung. And our pulmonologist said, uh, yeah, they've never seen infection look like this. And he was too unstable for them to do a transbronchial biopsy, but they were able to get some brushings. All the uh, infectious workup came back negative, but this um, ended up being a mucinous adenocarcinoma of the signet ring type, which is very unusual in the lung. And uh, they looked for an abdominal source, and none has come uh, has uh, been identified. So this is presumably a primary lung cancer. And we considered it, but we were really focused on this being infection, given his uh, brain findings. And it turns out he ended up having press and having a seizure or a stroke or something, and his, all his symptoms resolved, but thinking maybe the press was a perineoplastic syndrome, but it did resolve without treatment of the cancer. So I'm a little puzzled by that. But this was just an odd-looking cancer. I mean, in retrospect, if we go back to it, clearly it's a bad-looking lesion. Um, I think what else may have fooled us is, I forgot to show on the lung windows, you have all this tree and bud in the region as well. And it's probably, we've just assumed it was all the inflammatory stuff spilling into the airways. So I don't know what we're going to do at this point. I, he needs to uh, be, uh, his staging is done, but I, th I don't know if he's going to be a surgical candidate or if there'll be a chemo radiation or what. But kind of a tough one. Well, so, Jeff, what, do you, what does PRESS stand for? Or uh, it's we... posterior. Uh, you'd have to ask one of the neuro people. They keep changing the name of it. It's that posterior. I think it's that posterior reversible. Uh, what Encephalopathy. Something yeah. Syndrome. Yeah. One of those neuro so... things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And then just quickly, uh, this is a case sent to me from the folks at uh, Augusta. This is a beautiful case here. This is a young uh, patient you can see has huge pulmonary arteries. Here's the lateral radiograph. You can see the dilated right and left pulmonary artery. And um, this patient has a atrial septal defect with Eisenmenger syndrome. And I've got the uh, echo images. And they just show you how big these are. They put some measurements on. These are huge. So here's one of the echo. And you can see here we've got the, uh, the, the defect in the atrial septum. Another image here, let's see, just another one showing really this flow. And you can see the reversal of flow instead of from left to right, from right to left, because we're going away. So this is an Eisenmenger. You know, it looks like there's um, some RV hypertrophy as well. I'm, I'm sorry, from left, yeah, left to right. Um, and there's some uh, RV hypertrophy. So just a really bad ASD that had gone unrecognized for some time. I don't have all the details in front of me. But I will send this along. It's a really nice case. All right. Um, that's all I have this week. Let's see. Who would like to go next? I can go anytime you like. All right, Howard. Right. Okay, I'll start with this one. So the context of this patient is a person with interstitial lung fibrosis and this image is from January but when he presented in October recently and uh, thanks to one of my colleagues Phil Caligiuri for telling me about this case, he presented after apparently spells of coughing after one of which he developed sudden severe right anterior chest pain, parasternal chest pain. So let me show you the coronal, which shows the findings really quite nicely. So right paraspinal chest pain. So let's go way up in front and you will see one, two, one, 
to three in a row costal cartilage fractures. One, two, and three. And I'll show you the axial images, and you will see that adjacent to at least one of them here, presumably some blood contiguous with the fracture, maybe there as well. I'm not sure that I've seen this before, acute costal cartilage fractures from a spell of coughing, producing apparently excruciating chest pain. But these are new from before, and that correlated exactly with the site and his symptoms. So certainly we've seen fractured ribs from coughing, but I don't think I've ever seen this, or maybe I've missed it, but costal cartilage fractures, as you see there, quite impressive, huh? It's interesting, yeah. Howard, that they're so contiguous. Yeah, that's they are. Odd, almost three in a row. Because we've seen, I think I showed a case of a traumatic one, a blunt trauma one, but it would be, I don't know, it just seems odd to see a cough fracture three in a row. It makes you wonder if there was more to the story. Yeah, I don't know. That's what the history we got, and there, there wasn't any blunt trauma. I was wondering about a little opacity in the fat there. If there's more to the story, like falling against a chair or something, I don't know that but apparently it was contemporaneous with a really bad coughing spell or spells. So really curious, isn't it? In there. So that's what we think it is. All right. This one is interesting. So the entirety of this case came about as an unexpected finding in the context of imaging for a TAVR. So of course they get the chest and the abdomen combination. So all that I'm going to show you was unexpected. So here's the chest radiograph and you see some abnormality there. And thanks to Leif for telling me about this case. So the big pertinent finding in this case and you'll see in a moment, I'll show you a pet, but there are some subcutaneous lesions and lymph nodes. But one interesting finding in this case was this right here. So he's got pleural disease, but he's got this solid lesion, which of course is contiguous with pericardium and the base of the chest. And you can see a small vessel there. And actually, if one follows that small vessel down, it actually is sort of similar to the one Jeff showed in the sense that this vessel coming here is actually coming from the upper abdomen. So there is, it is right there. And here you can see that vessel going to near the uh, celiac axis there as well. So he's got that soft tissue mass with a vessel supplying it from the upper abdomen. And then the finding in the abdomen part of the CT was related to the bladder, which you see there. So here is a mass contiguous with the bladder. And in addition to that, as I'll show you now, he's got other lesions related to lymph nodes. So here is the PET CT, and you'll see the FDG avid lesions in multiple locations. There are the inguinal, there are the bladder, and the FDG avid lesion here in the chest. And you can see others starting to appear as well. So the lesion near the bladder was biopsied, and this is a lymphoma. So that was unexpected. And you can see this is a B cell lymphoma. And he is well, he's positive for hepatitis C. So this has been described, or there is an association, which I forgot about, between hepatitis C and B cell lymphomas. And I'll send this one along, but he's not that symptomatic from it, so they're going to deal with the cardiac issues and then reassess the state of his lymphoma at a later time. And when I went to Google, of course, I could find the association between HCV and particularly B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So he has a really interesting, unusual, unanticipated presentation of an indolent low-grade lymphoma.
This one um, is a nice case. So let me show you this, which was read as normal, but you know I like to show these um, cases of pulmonary vessels and pulmonary blood flow. So I'll make this one big. So the interesting finding about this is the notion that the vessels are a little bit distended. So for example, if we go up and we compare an artery here, almost in cross-section with the adjacent bronchus, it's a little bit larger than it should be. Here is a nice big vessel. So that is distended. And then if you look at the vessels in the right suprahyalar region, I teach that if you can see multiple vessels, the artery is medial to the vein. So we have distended pulmonary veins here and distended artery there. And this is the so-called balanced distribution of pulmonary blood flow. The pulmonary artery is a bit distended. And when you see that, and it's not a question of overhydration, one should think of increased pulmonary blood flow, and in an adult, particularly a left to right shunt and an ASD. So this is a really subtle, but a really nice teaching case for analyzing the pulmonary vessels. So here is the superior sinus venosus defect right there. Yes, right up here, there is PAPVR to the SVC, and that is the lesion. Uh, the patient did have surgery, and there are two procedures for this. One that they ended up doing, and I don't know exactly, um, you can read this, but there's a, there's the so-called warden procedure, but there's also the so-called dual patch procedure. So he has one in which you close the uh, septal defect, the atrial septal defect or the patch, and then stage two, you enlarge the superior vena cava and you direct the blood flow to the uh, left atrium. So the patient had this two patch correction of this sinus venosus, ASD, and PAPVR. So a really nice, nice teaching case. This one is interesting. I don't have an answer, but the context of this one is a young person, quite young, who has been here for a long time after being caught in a house fire. So he's in the burn unit, and he is uh, 10 years of age. And the finding here, and I'd like your opinion, but I think this is a case in which not only do we have thymic atrophy, but we have what appears to be calcium. So this is really quite high in attenuation. So there, for example, 185, 182 Hounsfield units in that relatively small thymus. And I did find one case report. I couldn't get the actual article, but here's one that's called transient thymic calcification, and then associated with rebound enlargement. So my speculation is that this may be a case in which, I don't know why, but calcium is depositing in that atrophied, stressed thymus in this context. Ever seen that before? He's got a sequel of ARDS and so on from his. I've not seen it, but... Power? Sorry, we, we, have a, uh, we have a case that I was going to show, but I'll, I'll show next week of um, diffuse thymic calcification, and we have to look back and see if it was due to rebound, but at the time we didn't really know what it was due to, but yeah, that's that's very interesting. What about yeah. the adrenaline? Were they calcified too? Was there that sort of stress? Um... That's as far down as I go in this patient, but I don't know about the adrenal gland under stress. And the kidneys who were working, this person didn't have renal failure or? No, not that I know of, no. Okay. No. So it's a speculation, but I could only find one case report of calcium and, and ostensibly thymic atrophy. And interesting, yeah. they described it as transient, which is interesting. Mm. Like that. It's curious, isn't it? Yeah. All right, if I ever find out more, I'll let you know. Uh, this one's a really nice case. Um, very similar to one that David showed previously. Now, this is courtesy of Tan, who sent this case of pericardial trauma. Uh, what's really interesting about this case is the appearance of where the heart is. So here's one image from the trauma. I don't have any more details other than trauma, but you can see the appearance of the chest and the tubes and whatnot and pneumothorax, and you look at the heart and it kind of looks distant and it seems rotated, and it sure is, as you'll see in a moment. So here's 
why the heart looks the way that it does. And as I scroll down there, let me just first go all the way down there, and you can see this is where the heart is. It shouldn't be there. It should be here. And just like in David's case, that's the pericardium. And there's, pericard there's pericardium, but that's the pericardium where the heart should be, right in here. But it ain't there. It's right outside of the pericardium, having herniated through presumably quite a large defect and just flopped over into the, into the left chest. David, do you remember that case you showed us a couple of years back, looking identical to this pretty much? I, I don't remember it, but um, I, I'll, I'll go back and find it yeah. because yeah. this is extraordinary. Yeah, the one that you, that you sent us looked identical to this pretty much, and you showed us this before and after surgery. And this appearance right here is exactly what your case had as well. And the heart is right outside of the pericardium. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Here's the coronal. All right, those are my cases, Jeff. All right, thank you, Howard. Those were fantastic, as usual. All right, um, David, you want to show some cases? If you have any this week? I have a diaphragm case. Um, oh, right. I can let's play here. Let's see. Make you presenter. There, you should be presenting. Well, let me. Um, let me. I'm going to say not yet, but. Okay, you want to try again to make me the presenter? All right, let's see. Um, it says you're the presenter, so let me make myself the presenter and be the presenter again. Now try. Okay, here we go. We see Renkin Grams. Ren Renkin O Grams. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a fellow who had uh, a few rounds of heart surgery. Let's start back here on the right hand right hand screen. You can see he has a slightly big heart. He uh, had heart failure and he got an LVAD. So at this point, an LVAD was placed, and you can see that he lost a lot of lung volume. The LVAD was placed from two with two anterior thoracotomies. They didn't do a sternotomy to do this, but they made incisions on both sides. You can see he's got drains on both sides. So this is after the placement of the LVAD. And then he had persistently low lung volume. Um, he was unable to sleep lying down. His wife said that he had to sleep propped up for many months. And then eventually he got a, he got a heart transplant. So at this point he's got a new set of uh, wires now and he has a replacement heart. And he's persistently low lung volume. So he wasn't recovering that rapidly from his uh, heart transplant. Um, he was, there was a lot of respiratory distress. He had to be propped up in bed and so forth. And the cardiologist tumbled to the fact that he probably had a diaphragm problem on both sides with this low lung volume and his inability to sleep flat. And it probably arose at the time the LVAD was placed. So had they been aware of the diaphragm problem, they wouldn't probably have gone ahead with the uh, heart transplant. But he was a young enough guy that he was he survived all those procedures, and he has low lung volume here. So let's um, let's look at his CT scans. Here's a CT scan from um, September. This is the time. Um, this is before the transplant. But you can see if we go down to his cruise here, it is quite thin, and this compares to a earlier CT scan from March. Get rid of this, and you can see that back in March before he had any of these procedures, he had a big heart and he had nice muscular cruise on both sides. So we have thinning on both sides like this and this suggests that he has bilateral diaphragm paralysis here given the degree of thinning of the cruise here on both sides. So um, he did get a sniff test uh, and um, the sniff test is interesting because it shows the, a, um, a potential problem in interpretation. So I'm going to show you two, two different uh, 
sequences from this sniff test. I think I've got two different sequences here. So when I fluoroed this fellow, uh, he was standing at this point, and I was surprised to see this much diaphragm motion here as he breathes in and out. So this is deep breathing. It's not very deep, but you can see he's got orthograde movement. So orthograde means that the diaphragm goes down when the chest wall goes up. And you can see that his chest wall is going up as his diaphragm goes down. So I was surprised to see this degree of motion of the diaphragm. Um, and so I, I dropped him to 45 degrees elevation on the table and then finally to supine position. And this is supine position. You can see that his resting lung volume has decreased from before. And look what happens now when he tries to breathe. There's almost no motion. But notice that his abdominal, um, nicely outlined in uh, gas here, his, his uh, viscera here are moving down when he, when he breathes in. Okay, and his chest wall is trying to go up. But his diaphragm is not doing very much. So we've got this abdominal motion here, but we don't have any chest motion. So why, why is it that he appeared to have some muscle function when he was standing, but he doesn't have it when he's supine? And okay. it turns out, go ahead. Um, do you mind if I, if I propose a theory, maybe? Or yes, one to think of? I would be delighted. Okay. Yeah. Some patients with bilateral diaphragm paralysis adopt a, a pattern of breathing mm -hmm. in which they actively contract the anterior abdominal wall muscles, mm -hmm. driving the diaphragms up. Right. Then, when they breathe in, the diaphragms that have passively been driven up fall and actually move down. Right. And you think they're actively contracting, but the descent is passive and the chest wall is going up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the explanation for why you think the diaphragms are actively going in the right direction. They are, but not because they're contracting, but rather because they're falling. That's right. So this is passive motion of the diaphragm that is uh, the result of using the abdominal muscles to force air out um, and then relaxing them to allow the diaphragm to fall and create this inspiration. So it's, uh, it's pseudo diaphragm function here caused by using the abdominal muscles. And there are two ways to defeat that, um, that, that mechanism. And you're absolutely right about this. Uh, one is to put the person into a swimming pool. So if these people wade, out into the water and the water starts to cover their chest, this mechanism is lost because the weight of the water is pushing on their ab abdomen. It's keeping them from allowing their abdomen to, to pooch out and, and so forth. So they get dyspnea on immersion. The other way to do that, which is more practical than uh, filling the floral suite with water, is to put the person supine. So once you're, when you're supine, this abdominal muscle uh, mechanism is defeated. It won't work anymore. And that's what we're observing in this guy. So this is called dyspnea on immersion. Um, and there's an article with that title here by Dr. McCool, uh, F.D. McCool and J. Mead. And this article was quoted and uh, discussed by John Armstrong from the University of Utah. So he was very aware of this phenomenon. And I don't think that his article is quoted here. I think that his article followed this. So this dyspnea on immersion mechanism in patients with bilateral hemidiaphragm paralysis dealt with this. And Dr. McCool uh, is very skeptical about diaphragm fluoroscopy because he thinks that it's possible to be fooled because of this abdominal muscle mechanism and that radiologists will misinterpret bilateral diaphragm uh, paralysis or hemidiaphragm paralysis. Um, and he, so he favors ultrasound. I think if you include supine positioning in your fluoroscopy, you're, you will defeat this mechanism of abdominal breathing and passive motion of the diaphragm and not be, uh, not be uh, fooled. I was fooled by a case like this about two years ago. The person had bilateral thinning. I expected no muscle function, but I observed this dramatic drop of the diaphragm on inspiration. And it's only afterwards that I realized that the person was using abdominal muscles. I was a little suspicious that something was, was uh, that there was somehow it was being faked because the descent of the diaphragm wasn't the slow, deep descent that you see with actual diaphragm contraction. 
it sort of fell, the diaphragm sort of fell suddenly, and that motion is abnormal, but that would go with relaxing the abdominal muscles. So dyspnea on immersion here, or and you can bring this, this phenomenon out with supine positioning during diaphragm plural. So Howard, you're right on. You, you, you got it. You pass. Oh, that's a lovely example of that phenomenon. Really nice. I don't think, I wonder if I've been fooled by that before. Probably have. If you practice long enough, you're going to be fooled by that. Now I, now I begin to wonder. <clears throat> Okay, that's, uh, that's all I've got, Jeff. All right, thank you. That was fantastic. Okay, let's see who else is here. Brad? Uh, yes, so I have some. All right, let me make you the presenter. All right, you should be able to show your screen in a second. We see it. Okay, great. So um, we have a couple of uh, companion cases uh, that were done um, pre tabby planning uh, within the last just two weeks that are very similar. So uh, this is a patient who had a um, history of a um, aortic uh, root and, and valve replacement and an ascending and hemiarch repair. And you'll see, you know, you see this fluid collection around the um, upper portion of the ascending portion of the graft. And this is just a fold, a bend in the graft right there that we're going by. But really the interesting thing is here um, at the root. Now this patient came in for TAVI evaluation because there was a, a fair amount of aortic um, insufficiency that was seen uh, across the valve um, in the setting of this. And this was, this valve was put in uh, several, you know, many years ago. And you can see here the reason for that, um, you can see the leaflets here, not all that thickened or all that calcified, but you can see that there is an unexpected kind of channel of contrast here uh, that goes around the valve um, and down through the LVOT. And um, this was interesting because the, the valve here is actually um, dehissed. So the valve here is dehissed from its normal attachment. And what they were seeing on echo was um, essentially this perivalvular leak that was going through this dehissed valve. You can see part of the dehiscence right there going all the way down to the LVOT there. So, um, so we, we considered and reading this that, you know, could this be due to um, an infection with a perivalvular abscess causing a leak um, due to this fluid collection. Um, now, as of now, the you know the patient is is is, is not um, does not have a fever, has no signs of infection, has no other secondary signs of infection. So, um, don't know if this is just true and unrelated um, uh, or what. But certainly, the the first thing that that, that I would think about um, in this case is a um, is infection with um, an infectious uh, perivalvular abscess here, but um, we'll, we'll see what this turns out to be. But it completely, you know, of course, changed the surgical uh, approach, and this patient, as far as I know, is not no longer being set up for, for TABI, uh, but for some sort of open uh, repair. So I thought that was interesting. Um, let me show you a, a quick other companion uh, case to that. So this is another patient who came in for a pre-TABI assessment here, and show you what, this was uh, courtesy of um, uh, Art Stillman who showed me this case, and just scrolling through, um, oh, so let me, um, let me pick up the, uh, the screen again here. Okay, so pre TAVI case here. Um, so scrolling through, again, um, TAVI evaluation, you can see the heavily calcified and thickened valve here, severe aortic stenosis. And scrolling down through the, um, the aortic root here, you can see this focal uh, contrast collection um, along uh, the the sinus here, along uh, the right aspect, uh, the right um, coronary sinus, and it really looks like um, this area is, is dehissed, and there's a little perforation there. And um, you know, these are common to see um, as perivalvular abscesses, and so you get a little bit of um, a um, an infection collection there, and then you get perforation, you get contrast going into that uh, little collection. Uh, so the interesting thing is on these patients that, um, you know, we didn't have real signs of infection, uh, but this is still being treated as if it could have been, 
um, could be possibly um, endocarditis with um, a periodontal um, absence. So just interesting what we're seeing in, in a lot of these TAVI planning studies that are you know, unexpected findings and um, very, very interesting. Wow. Um, just have another uh, quick case here. Um, let me show you, I'm going to pull up these two cases and I want to make sure I have the right, right one here. Um, let me pull up the screen so you can see it. Okay, so this is a patient who um, in 2007 had a lung transplantation um, for um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And um, over time, they developed uh, shortness of breath. And I'll show you, uh, this was in 2014, the CT that I'm showing you now. And you can see in this case, um, lung windows show, um, there, there's some mild mosaic attenuation. Um, there are some areas of, of, of um, band-like um, atelectasis or, or um, scarring that, that have developed. Um, but, you know, we're starting to think, well, could this patient um, uh, be developing some bronchiolitis obliterans? You see some clustered nodularity up here. And then let me um, let you look at the lung apices. Um, a little bit of nodular, what looks like nodular scarring at the lung apices. And um, certainly we want to keep our eye on this in particular to make sure that it didn't grow into something. Uh, but let me show you the really dramatic appearance after, um, you know, that first scan. So this is when I saw this patient in, um, just recently. And let me pull up the respiration here. Let me make sure that it's showing that. Okay. And this is what they look like now. So um, there's a lot, there's even more mosaic continuation and um, a lot of um, cluster nodularity, central lobular nodularity that, we're, that we see sometimes, um, uh, almost tree and bud um, in the setting of bronchiolase and Lorans. And so this patient clinically did have um, obstruction and did have um, bronchiolase and Lorans. Um, and the interesting thing, and I'll show the PFTs briefly. Um, so um, there's the scooped out appearance of the downside portion of the curve here. Uh, there was just obstruction. Um, and the interesting thing here to me in looking at the, we'll go back to the CT in a second, but the peak here is very uh, pronounced, it's not, uh, not blunted. And in fact, um, you know, in the setting of obstruction, I was expecting this. Um, Peak, uh, the ratio of the FEV1 to FVC ratio is actually um, about 56%. So I would expect this peak to be a little bit blunted instead of all the way up here. And I think one of the reasons might be, um, and, and the other interesting thing about this case was that if you look at the upper lobes, we're starting to get, let me go back to this series here, we're starting to get an upper lobe fibrosis type of appearance, almost a pleuroparenchymal uh, type of uh, fibrotic appearance in this case where we have this thickening here, this um, hypertrophy of the, sub, the extra pleural fat and um, parenchymal bands and opacities starting to form. Uh, there's retraction of the bronchi and adjacent uh, architecture here, architectural distortion. And let me show you the uh, coronal here. And it really is a nice um, case, I think, of um, an, sort of a um, restrictive allograft slash upper lobe fibrosis type of de developing appearance um, after a lung transplantation. So and we've seen a few of these cases and um, starting to develop a collection of these, but um, it is an, an, an uncommon you know, complication of lung transplant, but this upper lobe fibrosis appearance. I wonder if some of this fibrosis is responsible for some of the um, retention of the peak expiratory flows in this particular patient. It's hard to say, but I just thought this was a good case of bronchiolitis of um, um with also developing upper lobe uh, fibrosis and sort of restrictive allograft uh, syndrome. So um, the FVC was not... Um, was, was a, a bit um, decreased. I can't remember the exact figure, but I thought that was an interesting case of probably a blend of the two processes. So, yeah. Brent, Brent, was there was there a path diagnosis of the obliterative bronchiolitis? Uh, yes, there was, yeah, through transbronchial biopsies. So. And there wasn't infection, though? No, no, and in fact, this, um, these, right, and so the the cluster nodularity here, the almost the train bud, that was actually on um, a couple of CTs that I'm not that I'm not showing you. So um, yeah, that's that's certainly something that went through my my mind. Mm -hmm. so. With the obliterative bronchiolitis, you usually don't see inflamed bronchioles. You know, if, if you see little dots and branching structures, it implies that there's there's active inflammation. Um, 
usually with obliterative bronchiolitis, you see, really you don't see any bronchioles. They're gone. Um, you just see the blackness. So I would wonder if there was if there was if some sort of acute inflammation going on with all of those little dots. There, there may, there may have been. I mean, there may have been um, even a subclinical sort of because this patient did not come in with any sort of infectious symptoms, and and uh, they didn't really at this time they didn't do an additional uh, biopsy um, to to um, to prove that absolutely. But but I, I I have seen a few cases in which we had train bud that was uh, stable over over time, and and um, I I kind of attributed that to just a, a chronic. Um, you know, some component of the chronic uh, bronchitis, but um, but certainly, I mean, I you know, this could have been an infection, and I, I can't prove that it's you know there isn't some sort of subclinical infection here. So, right. I mean, that's that's a good point. I, uh, okay, and then um, let me just do uh, one quick one, and then just the last one um, if I could. And and this one was an interesting one. Um, this is a patient. Let me um, bring the screen up here. Uh, this is a patient who had. Um, um, uh, uh, tetralogy, this was a, a tetralogy patient who had repair and then had um, a melody valve um, implanted, which is the scaffolding that you see right here um, that is a um, pulmonic valve um, that has a bioprosthetic um, valve in the center of the scaffolding. Uh, there's also, um, I, I find it quite hard to see this, but there's apparently a, 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 a Palma stent in here as well. So there's apparently a two a scaffolding of a melody valve, transcatheter valve, plus um, a Palma stent in here somewhere um, as well. And the interesting thing is on the chest radiograph, um, I don't really, I don't think I would have mentioned much. I mean, you could say, well, you know, is this a little bit narrow um, or, or, or something? Um, but I don't think I would have mentioned what I'm going to mention on the CT here. Um, we can come back to this, but because there, there are some, well, some subtle findings there. Um, but here's what we see. Um, this patient came in with a um, high gradient across the, the pulmonic valve. And just in, if you look at this just in passing, it doesn't, uh, you know, nothing really leaps out. But if you start to break this down and look at the valve itself, you see that the scaffolding of the valve and the, the stent actually come uh, into the lumen um, to, um, in a sense, uh, approach upon the lumen. And it's harder to see in that um, um, view than it is in some of the other views here. Let me see if I can get up the, the coronal view here. I don't know why it's doing that, but um, you can see here on this uh, coronal view that um, the valve really has dis is disfigured and it's collapsed. And apparently there's a stent in here as well that also has collapsed. So um, by the time this thing had disfigured, um, these two lumens are actually very sonata. So that's actually the cause for this patient's um, high gradient. And you can see that we were getting this valve area of about 0.6. Um, so this is an interesting case of just how over time you know, forces, um, you know, uh, external to the, to the pulmonary artery, this had crushed and had um, collapsed. And um, uh, they're, you know, planning on um, trying to place another uh, um, valve on top of this, valve and valve, to try to salvage this before any sort of pulmonic um, valve replacement could, could um, you know, would have to be done via an open repair. But, but I just thought this was a really good case of a collapsed and a crushed um, um, valve. And in retrospect, you can kind of see that the internal structure of this is not quite right, and you could probably suspect um, that there's some disfigurement of this valve um, from the start if you know kind of what you're looking at. But, uh, but I just thought that was a very interesting case of a crushed uh, melody valve. And then I just have one one last case, and uh, this is the I'll show the CT, and then I want to show a couple of ECGs actually. So. Um, this is a 38-year-old uh, uh, man um, who um, had a history of sustained uh, VTAC. And unfortunately, you don't have an MR or contrast-enhanced CT, but this is what you see um, in the, um, the non-contrast CT of the chest. And you Brand see that he's already had... Brand yep. Oh, sorry. I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> okay. So he's... Can you see now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so he, this gentleman has had 38 year olds, 
years old, has had a history of VTAC, sustained VTAC, and had um, you know some EP studies done for that, had an AACD placed here. And the interesting thing is that in looking at the RV, um, the RV is, is, is very enlarged um, compared to the LV here. The RV looks enlarged, and the interesting thing is that the pulmonary artery um, is really not enlarged. It's normal in size. Um, there's really no um, significant emphysema or interstitial lung disease to explain this. And let's look back at the morphology of the RV. Um, not only is it enlarged, but you're starting to see almost, um, you know, a um, dysmorphic appearance of the anterior wall, the free wall of the RV here. You can imagine how there might be some little aneurysms here. You can see also some, some fatty streaks running through uh, this RV as well. Unfortunately, we don't have the MR, but what we do have is um, some um, ECGs. So I'm going to show you his um, ECG here. Uh, this was done when he was not in um, sustained VTAC, obviously, but I'll call your attention to um, these V4, V5, and V6 leads right here. And if you look at the QRS complex, you can see that it looks very strange. It doesn't look like there's just a QRS complex, but it looks like there's an extra little deflection here, an upward deflection of that particular complex. And you can see that in V5 there as well. And just to refresh your uh, memories about normal uh, EKGs, you can see a normal um, QRS complex uh, right here. So normal complexes, and then we'll go to a blown up view of uh, this gentleman's QRS complex right here. So, um, does anybody want to uh, tell me what this particular thing is that I'm pointing out? Right, so one of my residents actually <laughs> just <laughs> said the answer. So, that is an epsilon wave. So, that's an epsilon wave. So, that is, it's very um, specific for arrhythmogenic right ventricular uh, dysplasia. So, this is a patient with ARVD. Um, they have, um, you know, uh, gotten outside, unfortunately, we don't have it here, but outside studies um, showing um, severely um, uh, depressed RV ejection fraction and some dyskinesis of the wall. And so, um, with, in the setting of epsilon waves, um, I don't know if he has a relative with um, any sort of sudden cardiac death, but um, this is a um, you know, presumptive case of arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia with with um, the um, epsilon wave. So I just thought that was, I've actually never seen that um, in uh, clinical practice until this particular case, uh, but I just thought that was so so good that I couldn't uh, avoid showing it. Wow, that's very cool. Never heard of yeah. epsilon wave. Funky. Wow. That's, that's, that's all I have this week. All right. Well, thanks, Brent. All righty. Uh, anyone else got cases? Jeff, could I uh, could I show the Armstrong article which I found here? Yes. So this is John Armstrong's uh, article from way back from '92, and it was in response to the McCool uh, statements that diaphragm fluoro was misleading and shouldn't be done. He's an internist; you can tell he's not a radiologist, and um, so. John wrote this article with, I don't know, uh, Ian Chen here, perhaps a resident at Utah. Talks about the fluoroscopic evaluation and then concludes down here, simplicity and accuracy of fluoro may be established as widely available technique is diagnostically important if radiologists uh, do it in an intelligent way. Unfortunately, there's, you know, most people are not trained in doing diaphragm fluoro. He says that it's important to include um, recumbent with a patient recumbent, that will minimize interpretive pitfalls. <clears throat> so it saved my bippy in this case, um, putting the guy supine. I was very surprised at what appeared to be normal diaphragm motion with a patient standing. It's surprisingly good given the degree of his cruise atrophy on both sides. And then when I put him supine, I realized that this was a case of dyspnea on immersion that can fool you unless you do the supine. So Armstrong was all over this 20, more than 20 years ago. And um, I've just tumbled to it in the last couple of years. So uh, include supine if somebody has suspected bilateral hemidiaphragm dysfunction. Um, that's another thing to do, and I've, I don't, I've, not, I've done this once or twice, but if you are doing a fluoro exam with somebody else, like with the resident or another person, mm -hmm. and the person that's doing the fluoro is obviously standing and can see the person's chest and abdomen, but if right. the other person, and if the person takes the shirt off and you have a loose gown, looks at the chest and the abdomen, 
while you're doing the procedure. And one right. thing I've done before is that I ask that person to say in, out, in, out, based on where the chest is moving. So mm -hmm. when they say in, I know which way the diaphragm should be moving. So mm -hmm. if you had a person that was contracting the abdominal wall muscle, and if that second observer can look to see what the abdominal muscles are doing with the in, that might help. I've never tried that before, but now that I think about that, if you have a colleague or a resident, you can maybe take advantage and do a dual thing, do a dual observation thing. Yep. Okay. Well, I think uh, Jeff, I, I downloaded this case that David shared with us, so I can show that. Yeah. Um, the rupture of the diaphragm. So I can, if you do the screen, I'll show that pretty quickly. All right. So this is the case that um, David shared with us a couple of years back. So this is the case that looks identical to the one that I did, just showed you. But this is David's case. So there is the heart, and there is the thing. It's absolutely identical. So that's from U Washington. And isn't it the same as the other? Amazing. Uh, you know, it may be the same case. Um, because uh, Ton, Ton, you know what, I, I would have sent the case to Ton. And now, wait a minute. Because I'm resharing it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure it's the same. I'll look at it because I think I looked at the DICOM data and some of the DICOM data was labeled uh, Florida not uh, Washington so okay I don't think I don't think that in the DICOM header could be changed but okay but I wonder because doesn't it look the same I'll put them side by side which I haven't done but I did look at the DICOM data so I wonder yeah. if, if that's the case uh, ah. would you email me what with your results on that okay. this, looks, this looks so similar <clears throat> because let me see up. I can, you know, the way I do it, of course, is I just go to the DICOM data, and this one is GE. Do you guys have GE there? Yes. And some of this should be, of course, um, anonymized, but I think that the one he shared with me had some of the DICOM data from, from uh, Florida. I'll check and make sure because it sure looks the same. I can, I'll put them side by side later. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. All right. Talk to you next week. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.